Coming up on Point News, one of Europe's most famous historic sites was tragically damaged earlier this week due to a fire. Find out how long experts say it will take to restore the famed structure. And the NFL has a new highest paid player. Find out which NFC quarterback received a massive payday heading into the 2019 season. And hear how a six-year-old McKeesport girl won an award for making a difference in her community. Point News starts now. When we think Live from the Point Park University Broadcast Center in downtown Pittsburgh, this is Point News. Welcome to Point News. I'm Megan Masiosi. And I'm Noah Strachbein. This past Monday, the, the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris caught on fire, causing mass damage to the 856-year-old building. The fire alarm first went off at 6.20 p.m. local time. 20 minutes after the alarm went off, church officials went to the attic, also known as the forest, due to its ancient wooden beams, and it was engulfed in flames. Within an hour, the iconic spire fell from the top of the cathedral, and the fire burnt through the wooden roof. According to Dr. Emily Guari, a senior lecturer in medieval European history at Kent University in Britain, the rebuild could take up to 40 years to complete. The cause of the fire is currently being investigated by French authorities. According to court files entered on Monday, actress Lori Loughlin and her husband, Massimo Giannoli, pleaded not guilty to conspiracy charges in the college admission scandal. Prosecutors say Loughlin and her husband paid half a million dollars to a fake charity to get their two daughters accepted into the University of Southern California, falsely claiming they were crew prodigies. The criminal complaint against the couple includes evidence from a cooperating witness, emails, bank records, and a recorded phone call with each parent. This is the couple's first public response to the charges. If found guilty, they could face up to 20 years in prison. And now, a Point News feature. Reporter Sarah Yobi brings us the story of South Hills Pet Rescue and their efforts to rescue dogs like Scotty from meat farms in South Korea. When we think of dogs, we think of best friends. Good boys and girls who love playing fetch and kissing their owner after a long day. Scotty, a Jindo rescued from South Korea, is finally experiencing all these things. Scotty has grown tremendously this year, according to his trainers at the South Hills Pet Rescue on Old 88 here in Pittsburgh. One is definitely ready, Scotty. Um, he's made a huge turnaround. He came actually in with his brother Val. His brother Val was not as traumatized and was, was adopted pretty quickly. Scotty took a little longer. He's ready now. 30 of Scotty's friends are not quite ready. After experiencing inhumane treatment by meat farmers, these pups are beyond squeamish around people. The good ones are shipped off to other rescues, other placement partners for the humane societies. And then I take the, the difficult ones, the ones that are left behind that need a little bit more help. Nick Ferrero is the owner and on-site trainer at the South Hills Pet Rescue. Uh, some of them have been food motivated. Some of them have been uh, people motivated. You know, once they start to like uh, your presence, uh, I've had a couple of them just start following me on their own. Yeah. They live out in the, in the weather conditions in the winter. Some of them haven't seen the light of day until they got on the plane to come here. The conditions on Farm 10, where Scotty and his friends are from, are more than distressing. Nancy, the senior associate of PR for the Humane Society International, informed me that once the rescue team arrives, they put hay on their wire cage floors. The hay is to keep the dogs more comfortable throughout the lengthy removal process. So what the Humane Society of the United States does is they go in and they will help these farmers by closing down that farm, shutting it down, tearing it down, placing all the dogs, and then starting them with crops. According to their website, the Humane Society has permanently closed 14 dog meat farms in South Korea over the past four years. Nearly 1,800 dogs have been rescued and sent to safety. Eating dog meat is a custom for older generations in South Korea, but on the same page of their website, the Humane Society claims, quote, there is increasingly vocal, local opposition to this trade due to the cruelty. Yes, it's sad, and yes, it's torturous. You know, and I wish it would stop. The Humane Society works with pet rescues across the world, just like the one Scotty's at. When they get into homes, they flourish. I mean, these dogs, we get updates all the time, and it's amazing how, when they get the care and the love, that they can turn into a dog. Same thing I want to see for every dog, a nice loving home, uh, you know, good atmosphere for them. Um, 
you know, I, I, I like to see dogs have fun. I like to see dogs enjoy life. It makes me enjoy my days a little better. Each of these dogs has not truly had the experience to be exactly that, a dog, until the workers at the South Hills Pet Rescue got the opportunity to work with these dogs and love them truly. Scotty is flourishing and ready for a home. A McKee Sport family has been making a difference for its police department in a big way. Reporter Marley Pinchock has a story on this Point News feature. When life gives you lemons, squeeze them into a fresh batch of sweet tea to begin the journey of making a difference in your own community. This was the Estotian family's mentality last August when six-year-old daughter Peyton told her parents about wanting to have a sweet tea stand so that she can raise money for someone in need. I said a long time ago, whenever I was probably like six, um, but I want to do some stands and raise money for someone. And my mom said, why don't we do it for the canine units? And I said, sure. Myself and Jessica said, you know, well, think of a cause to give back to because we're blessed enough. We don't need anything. Uh, so, you know, kind of put a couple of things together and that's where we ended up with uh, supporting the canines. Peyton's mom and dad arrived at this idea by combining her love for dogs as well as her dream of following in her uncle's footsteps to serve in the police force when she grows up. I dreamed it since I was a little girl in pretty school. And just like that, Peyton's canines was born and Peyton's parents continue to help her every step of the way. I'm just mom, <laughs> AKA social media organizer, AKA promoter. Uh, I'm the laborer. <laughs> Whatever the mom wants and Peyton wants, I kind of do. Raising money for struggling canine units was further inspired from devastating news involving a man's best friend that struck their local McKeesport police station in August of 2018. Our first mission was to help the McKeesburg Canine Unit for the mere fact that that's home for us. And we knew that, um, that they weren't funded by the city and there are multiple canine units that aren't. According to the city of McKeesport Police Department's Facebook page, their canine unit is 100% funded through community support and fundraising events. And they had a canine that was actually diagnosed with cancer. This canine dog goes by the name Farkle and his owner is Officer Nick Matthews. And they were struggling with some medical bills. Farkle's medical bill was roughly $9,000. At $1.50 per cup of sweet tea, along with generous donations from customers in the McKeesport community, Peyton's Canines raised a whopping $700 in two hours. So there was probably 100 to 150 people came by. They presented this contribution on a grand personalized check, all to help Farkle, hopefully wagon excitement once again. I think it was a really a community effort, um, you know, and, and I'll say it and people may call me crazy, but it, McKeesport's a tight-knit community and when they see somebody trying to do good in McKeesport and um, here's this six-year-old at the time girl just trying to raise money for canine units, you're going to stop. This success drove Peyton's canines to host their second event. This one with a beverage perfect for winter. With the hot chocolate stand that we held in January, uh, we raised $2,400 to, to give to the McKeesport Canine Unit. According to Peyton's Canine's Instagram page, the family attributes most of their success to their prominent social media presence. For the hot chocolate stand, we did that for five weeks where we were on social media every week, every day, posting videos, talking about it. Um, we were on the radio twice. Uh, we were on the Bubba show and we were on the Andy Davis show for Y108. So that was awesome and that helped immensely. Peyton's Canines is a family effort. And although busy schedules may get in the way. I'm in school, I work and Peyton's canines at this point. Whenever we're not working, we're, we're kind of focusing on that. They make it work. He's definitely the person that I go to and just vent, you know, when something's not going the right way or what can we do here? And, you know, we bounce ideas off each other all the time, so. And when you're least expecting it, surprising special moments make it all worthwhile. I have the level word, and this is it. 
The mayor of McKeesway gave it to me. We're not really doing this for any type of recognition, just uh, want to do better in the community and, and do better as just people. Reporting for Point News in downtown Pittsburgh, I'm Marley Pinchock. Coming up, Point Park's Public Relations Club and Capstone Class held an event to raise awareness for organ donation. And later, one of Pittsburgh's first house I'm show really venues sure is closing really, its yeah. doors. Hear the story of the Bushnell and why it meant so much to many local musicians. We'll be right back. I don't know, did you hear that too though? Go to our new website, uview.pointpark.edu. Go, 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 go. <laughs> Join UView and find your herd. Join EO. And three, two, one. Join EOP. I was just going to grab him now, or else I will send him. Yeah. Oh, Join on point with politics. Three, two, one. Join Pioneer Sideline. It's a beautiful day to be outside and enjoy the weather, but it looks like we might have a few storms coming our way. Point News reporter Jevin Flugel has your Working weekend donation forecast. donation is extremely... Jevin? Hey, how are you guys doing in the studio? It's no longer a wonderful sunny day outside. The, w the current temperature is 71 degrees. The high is 83 and the low is 64 out today. This Easter weekend is... Basically, a 72 um, high and the low is 56 degrees out, and the precipitation is 50%. The, um, on Saturday, we have a high of 61 degrees and a low of 46 degrees, and precipitation is 20%. And on Sunday, Easter uh, Sunday, it's 60% high and low is 49%. Uh, we have a precipitation of 50%. So back to you guys. One of Pittsburgh's more popular venues for house show music is closing its doors. The feature from Point News reporter Matthew Morantes tells us the story of the Bushnell. The idea of it being successful first came out. I guess from the first show it was clear that, you know, there's a lot of talent and people were willing to come out and support it in a basement. <laughs> I've been operating Bushnell for about three years. I mean, I had been going to house shows for a while, and basically, I guess I moved in here, and then it took a couple months for me to, like, go in the basement and see, like, that it was huge and, like, sort of make the connection that, like, we could have a house show here. And, um, I mean, there's always room for more house shows or more house venues. But it was not just a venue. It was more like a home to non-native members of Pittsburgh, just like Julia Carbone. I'm new in the scene, and um, I felt really welcome there. Stu was a really welcoming, great guy. I'm originally from Utica, New York. I only knew about like six people, so I met a lot of people going to shows around here, and then through Stu got booked at the Chanel. I met a ton of people there at that show, and people who I have made connections with, like other local bands, and good, good lifelong pals, I'd say. A lot of the venues, around the area will only book like four or five band gigs at max because people sometimes get bored or it's just too much too late but Stu has no fear in that realm he'll book like eight or nine bands no questions asked and it'll go smooth sailing no problem at all and while Ben Herdman is not a musician he has attended well over 50 shows at the Bushnell and knows the importance of the approachability of a venue just like this 
I think it's really important to have a place where uh, you know people can gather and really put on for like the do-it-yourself scene. Um, the Bushnell is just sort of like infamous, like kind of everybody around here knows about it. And uh, I definitely think there's a lot of people who've gone there and seen their friends perform and uh, seen just some people that they met online, linked up with them at the Schnell for the first time. It's definitely really good for the scene around here. You know, house shows, basements, you can just uh, go and hang out with your friends, listen to some music, get everybody together. And as the doors of the Bushnell are closing in June, the community that made it its home today sees a hopeful future even after the last waltz is performed and the lights are drawn down. With a couple of house venues I know that are really into booking things right now with like touring bands and locals together. Hopefully they will continue the tradition that the Bushnell has paved and keep booking everybody that deserves to play. When the Bushnell started, you know, it was that was a time where there were like no house venues. I think, you know, like there was one in South Oakland, but it got shut down and there was like literally nothing. So that sort of helped pick up steam for the beginning at the at the Bushnell because, you know, there there is a need for that, especially. And I think, you know, the longer there's a need, there there's more likelihood for people to step in and like make it happen. week, PRSSA held an event to raise awareness for organ donation, and I was there to cover the event. It has recently seen a decrease in donors. Point Park's Public Relations Capstone Class and PRSSA Club decided to host an event to help raise awareness. So Core Carnival was an idea derived from Core, which is a center for organ recovery and education. Nancy, we worked with, um, is outstanding, and she said we they, they needed help coming up with an idea to further organ donation signups. Um, there's a real lack of people that are interested in signing up to be organ donors because there's a lot of misconceptions. So we put this event into place to better that level of signups. Uh, we knew we needed to do something that was interactive and interesting in a college community, but still educational. So we came up with the core carnival. That way it was carnival, there's free food, there's games, there's raffles, but there's also that educational aspect of it. The educational aspect included answering true or false questions at each booth about organ donation. For every correct answer, you earned a raffle ticket that could be used for the raffle or games. PRSSA was not the only club involved. Instead, they opened up the carnival to other clubs on campus. So we have multiple groups from campus that are running different games downstairs. So there are the Forensic Science Club, there's the rugby team, PRSSA. Um, we also have a club from our capstone class that's also running a booth and just running multiple of games and raffles. The event was extremely successful and helped raise awareness on campus. Reporting for Point News, I'm Megan Masiosi. It was a disappointing week for Pittsburgh Penguins fans, but not for those of golfer Tiger Woods. Point News reporter Tramel Perry has your sports report. Tramel? Last weekend, Tiger Woods captured his fifth career victory in the historic Masters Tournament. Woods finished the tournament with a minus 13 and was able to hold off four other competitors who finished one shot behind him. This marks Tiger's 15th major victory and his first since winning the U.S. Open in 2008. The Pittsburgh Penguins season came to an end on Tuesday as they fell to the New York Islanders 3-1 in Game 4 of the Eastern Conference quarterfinals. The loss capped off a four-game sweep of the Penguins who failed to find any offense against goaltender Robin Lehner, who allowed just one goal in each of the last three games. This marks the second straight season that a Barry Trotz team has eliminated the Penguins. Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson is now the highest-paid player in the NFL. Wilson and the Seahawks agreed to a four-year, $140 million deal that also includes a $65 million signing bonus. The Seahawks finished last season with a 10-6 record, but fell to the Dallas Cowboys in the first round of the playoffs. That's all for sports. Now back to Megan and Noah at the desk. That's all for this week. Thank you for watching all semester long. Point News will be back next semester on Thursdays at 2 p.m. with uh, 2 p.m. Excuse me. Have a great summer, pioneers.